Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Let's start today's seminar. So today, uh, seminar speaker is Professor Dong Yijong from Penn State University. And now he, he is uh, visiting in Kiat. So we can uh, ask many questions to Dong Yijong. And his uh, title is Searching for Documental Black Hole from LBK, Gravitational Wave Detector. Yeah, okay. let's start. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. And when I show the title to my friends, they said, I know that I know black hole. I don't know what dark matter black holes are. <laughs> and I'll explain to you what they are. And LBK stands for LIGO, Virgo, and Cadra. And then there are three gravitational wave detectors we have on this planet right now. So this is basically a cosmology. So I should start from this slide. Oh. This slide, that in the case that you forgot about our fundamental parameters, so this is the pie chart as of now, and this is a pie chart uh, 13.7 billion years ago when the CMB was first released. Actually, each one of these numbers are primary observable from the CMB and astropy, okay? and they are the secondary, so we know better about our universe at this time and now because of the CMB. And with these numbers, we can reconstruct the history of the universe from the very beginning that we think that uh, presumably there was a um, brief period of acceleration that we call inflation. And then now we are here, we have CMB. And this is called the concordance cosmology. The name of the game is that we use the physics theory that we have discovered in this, on this planet to apply this to the universe and to find out a concordance or the co consistent history, consistent story about our universe, right? We cannot go any of these places and then to do any of the measurements, right? We only got the photons and then it's our imagination to feel the story. That's what cosmologists start doing. Okay, and then there are many puzzles in cosmology, but then these days people are trying to solve these four puzzles in cosmology. The first one is about dark matter, second is dark energy and inflation and neutrinos. And we don't actually know the nature of these building blocks in our cosmology. And the primary topic for today is dark matter. So dark matter provides excess amount of gravity but there are a couple of things that we know about dark matter. One of them is that they are, they are for sure not standard model particles. In particular, they are not atoms. They cannot interact with photons. So the story begins in 1932 when Prince Juicy uh, looked at the data, right, uh, explaining this object. This is called a coma cluster. It's a digital galaxy cluster. From here to there, it's about 60 megaparsecs. And this cluster itself is about 100 megaparsecs away from us. And this is where this cluster is in this picture. This is the uh, distribution of galaxies measured by two mass galaxy survey. And this is called the galactic coordinate, means that our galactic plane is on the equator. Okay. In this coordinate system, coma clusters is right at the north. So this is a place for coma cluster. You can find other interesting cluster. But I just want to show you that this is real thing that nearby we can actually see that cluster. And these, these are numbers about this cluster. So essentially all dots in this plot are galaxies. Okay. And there are about more than 10,000 galaxies in this plot. Okay. And the size of this cluster, oh sorry, it's six megaparsecs, not sixty, six megaparsecs which is about two times 10 to 25 centimeters. Huge cluster. And by looking at the distribution of, gal distribution of redshift of those galaxies that we have, and then you can measure the velocity dispersion. 
it's about 1,000 kilometers per second. So individual galaxies are moving with 1,000 kilometers per second. In, in fact, this is a line of sight velocity dispersion. Okay, that's what we can only measure. And the crossing time from one side, one end to, to, to the other end is about six times 10 to nine, six giga years, which is less than the age of the universe. Okay. And the stellar mass, if you, if you count all the light that you see, and then depending on the color of these galaxies, we know very well how to convert this light to the mass, right? And the stellar mass we calculated that way is about three times into 13 solar mass. Now that we know total mass, total stellar mass, and the size, we can calculate the escape velocity, which is, which turns out to be 140 kilometers per second. That's what puzzled Zuki. Okay. So individual galaxies, they move with 1,000 kilometers per second, which is far greater than the escape velocity. And then the crossing time is only six giga years. That means that the, the chance that these galaxies, these 10,000 galaxies are happen to be there is very low. So they must be gravitationally bound, but the data suggests otherwise. So what Tricky did was he surmised that Explain what is the crossing time again? Crossing time is a time it takes from the, the galaxy with thousand kilometers per second velocity going from one end to the to the other. That's a crossing time. <laughs> oh, there's so much sparsy. Okay, so he surmised that uh, there must be some invisible mass that helps to bundle these galaxies together. Right? And then this invisible mass must be this thousand over 140 square. That's the ratio between the escape velocity to the actual velocity to hold up these galaxies by gravity. Okay. So that was the first evidence that we had about dark matter. Second set of evidence came from this small fuzzy uh, object. Do you know what this is? This is again the same galaxy coordinate. Okay, and this is an optical image, and this galaxy is called the Andromeda Galaxy. Okay. That's a zoom in version of this galaxy. And as you can see, we can actually identify individual star in this galaxy. And what Vera Rubin did in 1970s is to measure the rotational velocity of those stars. And she measured it as a function of distance. So this is center, and the, this is just a distance from the center, the arc minute. And one side, galaxies are moving uh, away from us. Another side, galaxies are moving, coming toward us. That's why the sign changes. Okay? But the important thing is that this rotational velocity is based about the constant. It is not dropping. Okay, and then we have many other galaxies. Oh, sorry, there must be one galaxy here. That's another member of our local group. It's called M33. This is a beautiful uh, star forming galaxy in our local neighborhood. And for those galaxy, for this galaxy, people also measure uh, the rotational velocity as a function of radius. Okay, and inside. We have stars, so we measure velocity from the stars. Now, side we don't have stars, but we do have neutral hydrogen gas, and the neutral hydrogen gas is emitting 20 centimeter hyperfine transition emission. So, by using the radio, you actually you can actually extend this line all the way to say 50 kilo light year. Okay, and we have to compare this measure dynamics with the expectation from the visible disk. Because we can, we can count the stars, we can actually calculate the mass enclosed in each radii, in each radius. And then this is the rotational velocity we expect from the observed gas and star distribution. Okay. And there are clearly a gap between the expectation and what is measured. And then this rotational velocity is given, takes a number, it's proportional to 
g over r times m enclosed, mass enclosed in that radius. Okay. So we, we, we conclude is that is we must have some <laughs> invisible mass that fill the gap between what we expect and what we measure. Okay. So we also need dark matter in galactic scale. And what about the smaller scale? So this is a map of our local group. We have Milky Way galaxy here, Andromeda galaxy here, M33, somewhere here. And as you can see, more clearly on the zoom screen than here, so we have many smaller galaxies orbiting, uh, surrounding us, surrounding our Milky Way, as well as surrounding the M33. Those are the dwarf galaxies. The small galaxies, the smaller by factor of 100,000 compared to our uh, main galaxy. But this is our local group. There's so many dwarf galaxies. You can measure, again, the dynamics of individual stars. Okay, there are so many red giant galaxies. You can point them and then measure the velocity. This is the Fornax and Carter and Carina Car 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 and the Sexton dwarf star. Uh, it's, it's very hard to hard for me to convince you that there's a galaxy here, but actually there is. We, we measure dynamically. There is a there is a dwarf dwarf galaxy. So we play the same game for each of these dwarf galaxies. Uh, we measure at the function of radius the dynamics of star, the velocity, the line of sector and velocity, and then from this velocity measurement, what we calculate is the the, the density profile that is consistent to this velocity profile, okay. is that for many different dwarf galaxies. Individual color, different color shows a different dwarf galaxy. And again, the point is that the inferred density is much, much greater than the density that we can see. So this bionic density includes all the stars and gas particles. And in fact, this is a, one of the interesting object in, in the cosmos because in dwarf galaxies, uh, dark matter doesn't just exist, it dominates the density profile. Uh, dark, the dwarf galaxy is the um, astronomical object that's dominated by dark matter. In this Friday in Journal Club, I'll talk about uh, one clue about the dark matter that we, I mean, the people figured out recently, that by looking at dwarf galaxy and then tell dynamics, the Neil Darar argued that uh, all the action like particles that was out there. So it'd be very interesting to to read. So I'll tell you more about it this Friday. It's, it's me, right? It's you yes. and me this Friday. Yeah. It's about the fuzzy dark matter. So Schrodinger equation solutions cannot be cannot be the cannot explain this stellar dynamics in the dwarf galaxy. That's the uh, conclusion of that paper. So as I promised, we also know that these dark matter particles cannot be baryonic. That evidence came from the CMB. So here what I show is the either function of angular scale or the multiple uh, multiples from two to I think this is a couple of thousand. Uh, we, I show the angular power spectrum. Okay. Angular power spectrum encodes information about the, the temperature fluctuation. Okay. And then you can read this is about thousand, which is about 30 microcarbon squared. So if you get, if you calculate the delta T over T, the level of the, the temperature fluctuation we observe from the CMB is about 10 to negative five. And from the linear probability theory that underlies this, this theory curve right on top of the data, okay, that explains the CMB fluctuation very well. We know that between the CMB time, the CMB decoupling time, and now density probability density pervasion can only grow by a factor of 1,000. That's a proportional to the ratio. But then if you multiply 10 to negative 5 to 1,000, we, get st we still get 10 to negative 2, which is not enough to create the object that we observe, like galaxies or galaxy cluster. If, if the fluctuations we see in the CMB are the only fluctuations in the universe. Mm -hmm. That means that we need another component in the universe that has higher flux, higher density contrast than CMB, 
and did not interact with him. That is dark matter. So we need dark matter to explain our very existence. So that exclude that exclude us or planet from the from the candidate for dark matter. Dark matter must be non-baryonic, means they cannot interact with him. So the definition of baryonic is slightly different from the exact meaning from that. That's right, that's right. Yeah. Here baryon means anon, basically. So in some sense, uh, it should it, it just is saying that this interact with the photon, yes. including the magnetic moment or something like that. Mm -hmm. I mean that there are many particles which have no electric charging. So <laughs> oh, right. I think we do it, we include neutrons here. Neutrons or neutrinos. Right. They are, that's right. But neutrons and neutrinos, they don't participate directly, mm -hmm. but then they do participate because they are they are part of the atom, right? And then helium has charge. Neutrons are in the helium, right? Right. <laughs> yeah, but that's that's fine detail. <laughs> Yeah, because all these are quite yeah. careless for using this. Another piece of evidence is coming from the black cluster. Here I show you three different layers. The first layer is optical limit of the cluster. So you have two clusters, one here. Second layer is the distribution of mass that we traced by weak lensing. So here's blue. The, the mass distribution follows basically the galaxy distribution. And then in between, we have a gas distribution we trace by X-ray emission. Okay. Clusters ha have a very deep gravitational potential, so their electrons are very hot. So that's why they emit X-rays. But then look at this bulge up, right? This bulge up hinted that this is a moment of this small cluster passing from left to right, so this big cluster. But then we know the interaction rate of barium, barium gas, and but then what you can see is that the interaction rate of this mass, bulk of them are dark matters, must be much lower than the gas because the gas, while the gas was cold in the center, dark matters pass each other. From that analysis, what we can do is we can constrain the self-interaction uh, cross section. So the interaction rate is n sigma v, right? Because we know the v from the this dynamics, so we can constrain is n times sigma, but then we know the mass of this, this cluster. So n is translated to one over m. So that's why we get this sigma over m constraint from this measurement. And what else do we know? Uh, to figure out the possible interaction between dark matter and from atomic nuclei. What we have done is we prepare a material, very non-interactive. I mean, yeah, you are all experts on this. I don't have to explain it very well. And this is called direct, in, direct detection. And direct detection is like a limbo bar. So we are, we are waiting. The more we wait, the further we can lower this limbo bar. I think this plot is made at uh, 2012. I think now is we are in between xenon one tone and Zeppelin and looks so we are almost like here. Yeah, we're like one order of magnitude above the neutrino limit. The news, I mean, the conclusion is that we don't know what they are. Right? We cannot. We didn't constrain. We have. We only have constraint, except for these islands. They are all excluded. So <clears throat> today I'll tell you about the alternative route to study dark matter from gravitational waves. So here are three images. This is LIGO Livingston, LIGO Hamper, so the two US based observatory, and this is uh, Virgo in Italy. And Kagura in Japan, they jo joined from O3B, I think already two years ago, or last year. Uh, oh, and this is the compilation of uh, uh, dark black hole masses from at the function of date. So this is the very first. Uh, black hole event from the gravitational wave detector, and then we have so many events by now. 
And those are neutron stars that may be in it. And my question starts from looking at this lower mass end of this plot. Right? Why, why we don't see any of the blue points here? The, 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 and then I was interested, and then I was looking at possibilities of detecting them. So to, to, to see that, what I plotted was a signal curve and noise curve. These three curves are a noise curve for the LIGO. Advanced LIGO now means that 2018. And advanced LIGO full upgrade, that's a noise curve. And this is a noise curve for the Einstein telescope. It's a next generation uh, gravitational wave detector. And I also overplotted a signal curve from a binary black hole with 10% of solar mass, 1% of solar mass, and 10 solar mass when the binaries are one megaparsec away. So one megaparsec is a distance roughly between us and Andromeda galaxy. If something happens within our local group, we can even detect like 10%, 10% black hole binaries. Right? It's, not, it's not because we don't see those objects because we are the, our detectors are not sensitive enough, but naturally smaller black holes have uh, less louder gravitational wave signal. Right? So to detect the smaller black hole binaries, we can only detect them locally. Right? This is the horizon distance. So for gravitational waves, horizon distance is the a sigma detection limit as a function of component mass the equal, for the equal mass binary. So if you look at the 0.1 solar mass, 0.1 solar mass binary, you can go to the about 10 megaparsec. But if you're considering the smaller and smaller black hole, that your horizon is shrink toward the, the local object. So yeah. Horizon means the, the distance from the furthest distance that we can see this gravitational wave from this object. Not like particle horizon. Right now, the detector. <clears throat> but there are some argument as to why we don't expect those small black holes from the stellar dynamics. So this plot I got it from the Kip Dog Black Hole and Time Warp. That's a that's a undergrad textbook that I use in my class. And <clears throat> the star, they are they exist as a star because of the hydrostatic equilibrium between the gravity and the pressure gradient. Why do they have pressure gradient? Because the central part of the star is much hotter than the outskirts. So the pressure is very high at the center, then low and lower at the surface. And then this hot temperature at the center is provided by thermonuclear reaction, right? But then the stars, each star has only a finite amount of fuels for the thermonuclear reaction. When the fuel, the all bound up, and we call that at the back of the star. When I mean, a star mass like a solar mass, stops, like sun, died, and then the thermal nuclear reaction stopped, and then there's no pressure gradient anymore, and the star will collapse. Collapse in Helm, Kelvin Helmholtz time scale, which is about a couple of minutes. Okay? And it will be smaller and smaller and smaller, smaller, until it hit the boundary of white dwarf. Means that the star, instead of the pressure gradient by the thermal, thermal nuclear reaction, now the star can be in another equilibrium state supported by the electrons generate pressure. That's white dwarf. But then if a star twice as massive as sun, like Brockian, die, and then it will pass the white dwarf region. It will keep shrink, shrink, shrink. And then essentially what happens is the, the Inverse beta decay means that proton is an electron and then essentially make all the protons in the star a neutron. And then the star will be a giant neutron, giant ball of neutron. That's the neutron star. Okay. But then the, 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 there, are, there is a maximum mass that neutron star can have. Okay. But we don't know exactly at which mass because we, that, that requires a detailed QCD calculation, right? Because I, I said neutron, but then if you 
smash the neutron to very high dense state, it's not even a neutron anymore, right? It will be just, just some quark gluon plasma. So we have to understand that. But if we know that it's between two to three solar masses, very fuzzy. But stars, so then only stars, which is with whose mass is above that maximum mass of neutron star, that will be a black hole from stellar mass. That's stellar evolution, okay? That's the key. And here, do we see the maximum mass that neutron white dwarf can have? That's called a Chandrasekhar mass. And this Chandrasekhar mass for these parameters that we have for the electron mass, proton mass, about 1.4 solar mass. And this Chandrasekhar mass is very, very interesting quantity because it only involves two parameters. First one is a clock mass, second is a proton mass. So the clock mass over proton mass, of course, there's, there's some order in number here. Q times one. Okay. It's very interesting, right? It's like a Hawking temperature or the black hole entropy. It involves speed of light, h bar, and g. Okay. Gravity, quantum mechanics, and so, if you can plug in number 10 to the 5, right? And what proton mass is 10 to the 19, smaller than 10 to the 5. Plug in this number and then you get M0. And so you can also do a similar kind of calculation. The crucial part is that this proton or so this star is made out of well, fermions. If you, if you look at the bosonic particles, this cube will be squared. That means that if you have bosonic, boson, bosonic condensed black holes, its mass will be something like uh, square. So 10 to the 19, 19 solar mass. It's very, very small. So we should consider for the fermionic particle to make this transistor curve. So this observation, okay, good. So this, uh, so this one must be proportional of the one over <laughs> proton mass square. You can intuitively understand it. For a given solar mass, for, for a given stellar mass, if you increase the proton mass, then you only have small number of small, small number of fermions. So the generated pressure can hold up only so and so small, small mass, right? Because the generated pressure is basically your uncomfortableness because as the number of density increases. So you did, I want to use this possibility. The proton mass is proportional to, I mean, Chandrasekhar mass, which is the minimum mass of black hole pair, is proportional to the proton mass square. And then, I mean, fermionic mass square. <laughs> and we don't have to have, think about this black hole only made out of our proton, right? Black hole can be made out of dark world, dark matter proton. So that's, that's the best basic idea. So I want to, what I want for dark matter to do, is dark matter, what if dark matter can dissipate the kinetic energy? So that's a key. This patient is a key to make the structure in the cosmology. So the, here the model is, instead of having this one boring dark matter particle species, I make some varieties. We have X particle, C particle, and dark photon. So in this theory, we have four parameters, the mass of dark proton, Although I call this proton, doesn't have to be a combined three quark state, right? It just I need to be heavier, positively charged particle. Yeah. And then electron, lighter, negatively charged particle. And then the mediator, dark radiation. And here the, the parameters are the mass of X, the mass of C, and times of the constant, and C that's the, that's the temperature ratio. The key feature is the energy dissipation. If you think about what happens to normal cosmology with CDM and baryon, this is what happens. So at first, when halo first formed, we do have CDM and baryon. They just all occupy the big halo. At the end of the day, we know that we know that this will be evolved to this state where we have galaxies at the center, some structure, surrounded by dark matter halos. The key difference here between the 
CBN call document invariant is a radiative cooling. So what variants do is it interact with photons and then radiate photons, right? When it radiates the photon, it loses kinetic energy. And then if you lose kinetic energy in the gravitational potential, then what you do is you sink toward the center and form structure. So what I want Dr. Mel to do is something similar, because I want to have some stellar-like object by using dark matter. So atomic dark matter has that property. And of course, this is not the model that I invented. A couple of years ago, uh, Lisa also had some similar idea. And what she did was that she made the atomic dark matter model to have the secondary disk in the galactic plane so that then our solar system is moving, like it had to some wobbling motion up and down the disk. And then when you pass that secondary disk, and then gravity is somehow enhanced, and then it will enhance the meteorite activities and that kill the dinosaur. So that's what this book is about. But this model that she, she has studied was ruled out because in order to have the secondary disk, you need to have higher kinetic energy or higher photon energy for dark photons. In that case, we expect to have just like one primary DAO that we're observing in the galaxy power spectrum, secondary DAO that we can see. Okay, so that ruled out her model. But in our model, we have very low temperature of photon, means that the dark uh, recombination and dark acoustic oscillation, dark recombination happens very, very early on, and then dark acoustic oscillation may exist, but far smaller scale. That's how I bypass this constraint. And this is one example, oh, one example of the uh, dark recombination, just like our normal CMB recombination. We have as a function of redshift, we have the, 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 the ionization fraction, and that drops from uh, ionized, fully ionized to the neutral state. That happens around redshift 51,000, right? And then CMB decoupling happens, I mean, the dark CMB decoupling happens redshift 32,000. That brings DAO scale 0.02 megaparsec is not probed by galaxy survey, so you see. And this is the case for dark proton mass of 16 jeb, dark electron mass of 140 kV. But at the same time, though, I do not want to spoil the observed large scale structure. Right? So I don't want this cooling, the energy dissipation, happen for every halo. Right? So what I impose is something like a read or striker condition that this cooling time, the time at which the cooling process, energy dissipation process is important, is much, much longer than the age of universe. For the halos mass greater than 10 to 11 solar mass. That means that for those halos, cooling doesn't happen, and then we preserve the, the cosmic web large case structure. But we, what we can only change is the small halos. So that's what, that's what we did. And this plot as a function of the, the dark electron mass and then halo mass. This region, the green region, is the is a region at which uh, this condition is satisfied. Okay, so ha the halos in this color can cool to form this object. But then, uh, right. And outside, the cooling doesn't happen. So what we did was. Uh, yeah, 10 to 11 solar mass here. And then we choose our electron mass. This one. That's a model constraint that we use. Is this assumption just put by hand or? Yeah. Any dynamics behind this? Uh, dynamics. Since it, actually, this is uh, it's almost like a QED. So we have, I think that we should have some reason. Why such kind of gauges you play a very different role in the history of cosmos? Really? In these conditions? Yeah. yeah. Depending on halo mass. Oh, so this this cooling time is proportional to the number density. Number density. Yeah. Because the total kinetic energy is proportional to number density, and this cooling is a two-body process. It is proportional to n square. So the cooling time is one over m. Right. And then for a given redshift. The heavy halos are which way? <laughs> heavy, heavy halos are uh, sparse. 
So right. they, their cooling time is naturally not longer. So we can make a cut between the heavy halo and the small the light halo. It's cooling time depends on that. So I told you that there are important mass scale of the second mass, it's for inversely proportional of the photo mass square. Right. And there's the second mass scale called opacity limit. So while the energy dissipation happens, uh, the, that energy dissipation can keep the temperature constant during the collapse. I mean, if, you, if, the, if things gravitationally collapse, it should heat up, right? But then dissipation can re release those energy. <laughs> so the, they keep the temperature constant, but then then number density is increasing, right? But then you cannot increase the number density forever because at some point your surrounding is so dense that photon cannot escape. Opacity is very large. That's what that's called the opacity limit. There is a minimum genes mass, minimum mass of the stellar object, again for a fragment. That's also proportional to that, that's also the function of the proton mass and the temperature. And it's about 10 to 3 solar mass per the population three stars that we have. And oh, so dark star formation. So if you think about what happens here, is so that we have dark proton, dark electron. Right? And then we want to do something with those in QED. And then we have an exactly parallel phenomena that happened in our universe when the first generation of stars were formed. We have only hydrogen and helium. But helium is only 25%, who cares? So, so but in this, when, when I make the estimate, we use the population three binary formation literature and then we scale their masses and interaction rate with our parameter. That's what we did to make the prediction. So we made some prediction. So this is the mass function of dark black holes. So as a function of mass, I calculate the mass function of the, the number density per the mass spin. As I promised, uh, as we increase the dark proton mass, from 50 depth to 100 depth, 150 to 100, we can make the smaller dark matter black hole. And we also calculated the horizon radius for these three different the noise curves, advanced LIGO, current design, and then design sensitivity, and Einstein telescope. And this horizon distance can go for the 10% solar mass, go to like you know, tens of megaparsecs. From there, we can calculate the volume that we are searching. We can search for this 10% solar mass binary. And then for the gravitational wave amplitude, the important quantity is called the shirt mass. This is a, comb this is a combination of two mass scales of the mass sum and the mass ratio. Okay. So we calculate that. And then if you do this, if you know these two numbers, you can calculate the event rate. Right. So this is a table that I put in this paper. So as a function of proton mass and electron mass, the chandra second mass is very, very low, means that we can make the you know, very small black hole, right? And then dark black hole mass range is actually dictated by the, the minimum genes mass or passive limit instead of chandra second mass. And depending on the parameter, but if you look at this 16 GeV case, we expect the even current LIGO uh, one to 100 event. So we have this range of events because we have this parameter called the cooling efficiency and the star forming efficiency. I mean, you can think of this that way. Not every atomic particles in our, our baryonic world are locked in the star. Actually, the, the atoms in the stars are quite minor. Right? Just, like the, just like the same way, the, the dark matter locked in the dark matter black hole must be not 100%, right? So that's the fraction that we use. And then if I use 10 to negative 5, I get 1, 10 to negative 3, and I get 100. So this F is the cooling efficiency of forming and locking the dark matter in the black hole is, is one important parameter. So that was, was we are very excited, right? And then I came to my colleague at Penn State who is doing searching the, the you know, gravitational wave binaries. And then he, I mean, he was also working with a sub solar mass search channel in the LIGO. So we, work with, we are working with them currently. So let's look at the 
real data, this original black hole. So we have this event. So those uh, orange are called the LIGO verbal neutron stars. This one, these two, is very, very important and famous. That's called GW170017 because it happened at 2017, August 17th. Okay, so that is a kilowatt because right after the LIGO C, this gravitational wave, okay, right means that 1.7 seconds after that, we see the the gamma ray burst a signal from the integral and the Fermi satellite. Our main character, guess the other, is this one. It's not GW190425. They officially they designate this as a LIGO Virgo neutron star, but it doesn't have to. I mean, it's because there, there, there are no electromagnetic counterpart observed for this object. Okay, that's the only reason. And plus, this object mass is lower. The mass range for this object is so one is between 1.5 to 2.5, another is between 1.2, 1.12 to 1.68. That's around Chandra Sekar mass, but lower than the maximum mass of neutron star. So they designate that as a neutron star binary. Well, it doesn't have to be, right? It can be black, either neutron star binary or neutron star black hole binary or black hole, black hole binary. And one curious thing about this object is the distribution of total mass. So here, as a function of total mass, I plotted two distributions. The left-hand side is compilation of all X-ray binary neutrons that we see in our galaxy. And this is the distribution of, I mean, posterior distribution of this total mass of this object is clearly five sigma away from the, the typical neutron star binary we see in our galaxy. Although we have to make, I mean, we have to keep ourselves, uh, uh, remind ourselves that this, these are two differently selected binaries, right? This one is X-ray selected neutron star, and then it's gravitational wave selected neutron star. So they can be different, but I mean, this is enough to provoke the, curiosity in our research group. And can that be a, if this is very low, and can that be a primordial black hole binary? Just like we heard last week. Can that be? Mm. The answer seems to be negative. So this one is the, the uh, compilation of O1, O2, O3. So as a function of mass, we constrain the, the primordial black hole fraction if the LIGO LIGO's non-detection uh, can constrain the prime of the black hole. So that is a LIGO paper that I'm co-authored with. And then the, the fraction must be between 1% to 5%. But then, if this is really a primordial black hole, then to generate this amount of primordial black hole, what's required is to have large density fluctuation at the time. Right, they're all large as large as order, order unity, and the order unity density fluctuation should and must generate gravitational waves. Okay, and then for a given given mass of primordial black hole, we know the formation epoch. Therefore, we know the frequency of that gravitational wave generated from the density perturbation, and that one, those gravitational waves are redshifted conveniently for the, the pulsar timing array time <laughs> frequency. But the sad news for the prime the black hole people is that Nanogram, it's a US-based pulsar timing array experiment. So what they have been doing is they have been observing, say, 20 to 30 persons for about 20 years. Okay? Because they want to look at the, the systemic variation of pulsar timing sequence. They observe each person like they revisit once every week. So a whole year is like three times 10 to seven seconds. So they are looking at say millihertz kind of frequency range. But they haven't seen anything. From that fact, you can constrain the 95 upper limit for the FPVA. And for this mass range, it's like already 10 to the 10 to 10 to the 5. 
being consistent. I don't think they can be, I mean, the, the small subsolar mass black holes can be a primordial black hole. So what he did was we enjoy this possibility and ask ourselves, with this single object, what kind of constraints can be put to the dark matter properties? Right? If that object were indeed dark matter black hole. And the function of minimum is a standard sacral mass correspondence of dark matter black hole, or the, the oh, no, sorry, it's not standard sacral, no, the minimum mass, right? It, it, it came from the opacity limit, but you can also interpret that as a standard sacral mass if you just drop all the theory. And F is the fraction of dark matter that are locked, locked in the black hole. So if this single object can, if, if it were the uh, dark matter black hole, then we have this contour. It's a, this two sigma contour, which is, which is right near the chandra sector limit. Okay. But this is the minimum mass. So what you can translate is, we can translate this measurement to the constraint on the dark matter proper mass, which must be greater than about 0 0.96 GeV by 99% possible. But of course, official words from LIGO is that this is not a dark matter black hole. In that case, what you can do is you can put a constraint on the minimum mass and the fraction plane. Okay. So this is, the, this is from our paper in the Penn State group, and this is from the, the LIGO's official paper. The official statement is that this there's, there are no dark matter black holes detected so far. In that case, we constrain the fraction of dark black hole in dark, I mean, fraction of, yeah, dark black hole in total dark matter. So we have a constraint of this, and this is a similar constraint on the primordial black hole. Okay. So this is one example of constraining this dark atom atomic dark matter model, but this is not the only way that you can constrain this model. So, the key here, as I said a couple of times, is an energy dissipation, right? How efficiently can you lose your energy, right? And then energy dissipation process can have different aspects depending on the temperature because temperature defines a different quantum state. So if temperature of the system is very, very, very high, that means that your electrons and protons, the dark electrons and dark protons are essentially ionized. So then the, the major uh, the dissipation channel is the brown one, the free, free uh, emission. In that case, the cooling curve is this shape. And then as, you, as you lower the temperature, then some of the atoms are formed. And then, then we have some bound, bound transition as well as bound free transition. And then this cooling function has this, this term. And then if the temperature is so cold, then we don't have any any uh, free electron remains in the system and cooling doesn't happen. So this is called the cooling function. As a function of temperature, we can calculate the efficiency of energy dissipation. And different astronomical objects provide us a different temperature. For example, the galaxy cluster is at the very high temperature environment. And so this curve is the so lossless list galaxy cluster collision means that this is this is very basically coming from the bullet cluster constraint. So we must have, I mean, depending on the, the details of the model, and this or that, the interaction rate cannot exceed this, cannot exceed that. That's the limbo bar. And in the, in the in intermediate temperature, we have the halos at its formation time. It has to form enough dark matter black hole. We must have, I mean, this, this curve must hit this blue region. And here is the small temperature as corresponding to the dwarf galaxy because dwarf galaxy has this shallower gravitational potential. The temperature is very small. In that case, uh, in, in this is the uh, area at which the collisions, because the interaction is so strong, right? Collision would completely disrupt the dwarf galaxy. It's not a bad news because we have the, the missing satellite problems. So we don't need that many of our galaxies anyway. So that kind of, I mean, the key point is the different astronomical object can, can play a role at a different part of the cooling function. 
But then this is a cooling function for one particular example. And then we also calculate the cooling function, including the molecule. So this is the this is a paper that I have done detailed calculation about the molecule energy transition and then all the Einstein question of the dark hydrogen molecule. So uh, it, it is a standard molecule case below 10 to 4 Kelvin. The cooling energy surface is dominant, dominantly done by molecular hydrogen. And these are different dark matter models. At each dark matter model, we have different proton mass, different electron mass, right? In that case, the energy gap changes as well as the Einstein question. So we <laughs> take that into account to, to plot this. Uh, uh, the cooling function as a function of dark matter parameters. And we also have this anti phase diagram as a function of total density of particles in the halo and how temperature evolves. Right? This plot is normally plotted by the population three star literature because this loitering phase uh, determines the total mass of population three star. So here, how you read is this. So at first, the, this is the realization track. The, the heating happens as the clump collapse. And then once you form enough molecule, molecular hydrogen that tends to 3 Kelvin, then you start to cool. Right? But then you reach the local thermodynamic equilibrium, and then cooling stops, and then you start to uh, heat, but only gradually. Okay, that's, so this, this point is very important. That's why you plotted this. And then boom. to put everything in the cosmological context, what you have to do is also calculate the dark recombination history and dark acoustic oscillation and dark shift damping, all the darks. And we did it as a function of the, the, the uh, electron mass to our, our electron mass, like, like MC over 511 kV, and then proton mass to our proton mass, like M, Mx over 1 GV. As a function of that, we calculated uh, uh, this is uh, uh, molecular <coughs> fraction and dark acoustic oscillation scale. And yeah, the same thing. So we are ready basically to run a cosmological simulation of atomic dark matter. And we are currently working with other collaborators to to make this embod the tool to make the hydrodynamic simulation. Previously, I just borrowed the result from the public star literature, but now we can, what you can do is to specifically study this model in the computer. But even before doing things in computer, I can also do some analytical estimate. So as a function of the dark electron mass and the halo mass, this yellow region shows the reason that cooling is efficient. So we can cool, and this blue region is the number density of halos given this dark acoustic oscillation, which suppress the power spectrum on very small scale. So this is at ratio five. This horizontal line means that at ratio five, we only rarely find 10 to 11 solar mass halo. Okay, and this line means that for a given electron mass, right, because of all the universe dark acoustic oscillation, we suppress the power spectrum in some case, so it means that you erase density fluctuation on small scale. So we, we don't expect to see many of the small galaxies. So the what's important is that there are over, over, overlapping regions between this yellow and the blue, and sorry, the red and blue. And that, that means that we can cool this region, and then there are enough galaxies or halos that we have to cool. So that's the status. So here I tell you how to study dark matter models, atomic dark matter models, by using uh, the gravitational wave detectors and other astronomical observations. And what we are doing, what we have been doing so far is to come up with a detailed calculation of atomic and molecular transition so that we can implant that into existing hydrodynamic simulation to see the detailed uh, population and uh, history, formation history of dark matter, black holes made out of dark matter. Okay, thank you.
any question? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, when you are talking about the dark recombination, I mean, uh, this gamma, dark gamma or dark photon, mm -hmm. it has no interaction with normal photon, right? Right. In this model, we are thinking of the completely secluded. Then, uh, I mean, what are the basic opposite rules? I mean, how will you understand? How will you see that whether there is a dark relation or not? I mean, dark recombination. We don't see them, yeah, but we, we, we see their gravitational implicit. So, if there's this interaction when we dark photon and then they lose energy, I mean, that dark photon is there just to uh, make the energy dissipation possible. I mean, if you think about dark matter, and we only the guaranteed interaction of dark matter is correct. So we only see the shape of dark matter halo and then their density profile. Then if you somehow see very compact structure in the dark matter density structure, the density profile, how can you explain that? Because CDM cannot provide any dissipation. So if you have some compact dark matter structure, I think inevitably we need to have some channel through which dark matters can lose their kinetic energy. That's one of the examples. I think the, the atomic dark matter is good because we we are using it as a as a working horse model. But the big theme is that what if dark matter can lose its kinetic energy? And, and other than that, I don't think we have a way to detect dark, dark matter photons, but which is very ironic, dark photons. But you see something like it can affect the existence of uh, dark galaxies, like... Uh... That's right, yes, yes, yeah, yeah. That can, that's a, that's an opportunity, right? Yes, I mean, that is the question of how can it really affect it? Because if it has no interaction with the normal photon... Oh, because, because, uh, so this, this, this cooling rate is also related to the the, the interaction rate between dark matter particles. This, and so you can think of this, this atomic dark matter as a, as a self-interacting dark matter. So the, I think that this is collision that came primarily from the, the dark matter interaction process, which must exist if you have atomic dark matter, they interact by wrong energy force. So you consider the dark black hole formation take place just by the gravitational collapse? Right. So if you consider any other, many other pro production mechanisms mm -hmm. in the market, then maybe you can... <laughs> That's true, yeah. But then, then I don't know, I'm not a big fan of this, this uh, neutron star captures dark matter and make the black hole kind of thing because the capturing rate is so little. I mean, neutron stars are like a six, couple of kilometers, right? And their accretion is not so great. And maybe some topological objects. Oh, maybe, yeah, yeah. yeah maybe one hole. <laughs> Any other questions? Or in the Zoom? See no more questions. So the talk was very clear. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank Good you. Evening.